Hello and uh, welcome to the midweek message. Um, a little bit later in the week, I had some stuff going on yesterday that needed my attention, but here we are, ready to go. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm just excited and ready to dig into the Word of God. And um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about faith. Um, I, I know I had a couple months ago um, in a message um, called Faith to Move Mountains. And if you haven't seen that, I'd encourage you to go look at that one too. I'm going to just take it from another angle, go a little bit deeper into it. Um, and I encourage you to just read the full chapter of Hebrews 11. That's what I'm basing this off of. And it's known as the the faith chapter. And I'm going to start right there at Hebrews 11.1 because it gives a really great biblical def definition of faith. And it says, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen, for our ancestors won God's approval by it. If you think of Abraham, it says his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Um, and then it continues on in verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was created by God's command, so that what is seen has been made from things that are not visible. And, you know, that's... That's really the whole thing about faith is believing in, the, in what is not visible. And whether people want to admit it or not, even atheists have faith. They believe in the invisible stuff they can't see. And they don't want to admit it, but they do. And, you know, and, and then I wanted to pause for a minute about, uh, take a minute about evolution. And, and it's just a sad reality that people still believe in this. It's people fall for this sham even believers, even Christians. And and there's there's they're not going to be without excuse. You know, they always say, but the evidence, it, it points there. And it, no, it doesn't. You know, I don't, I don't have time to go. This isn't a sermon about evolution. I don't have time to go into all of it. But really look at it. Re look at, a, don't just accept what you're being told. Look at opposing viewpoints. Look at, there, there's scholars, PhDs, masters in, in their field who say evolution is a lie. The, the reason it keeps going is more political than anything. It's just, if you really looked at the evidence, it, it points straight to Jesus. It points straight to a biblical creator. And, and these people, they, they, they have to desperately hold on to it. I mean, it's pitiful, really. I mean, they got more, they got more faith than I do. It takes more faith to believe in, ev in evolution than it does to believe in a creator. If you really investigate, if you really looked at the evidence, really listened to the arguments on both sides, instead of just accepting what you're being told by someone who has an agenda. You know, look at the holes, the gaps, the, the utter nonsense that they're forced to come up with in their desperate attempt to hold on to it. And they do so, they, they have to. They, it's by their own belief, they, just, they have to desperately hold on to this. They don't seek evidence with an open mind and go where the evidence takes them. They have a predetermined outcome and they will only investigate, teach, look at, or even listen to anything that already proves what they what they already believe. And it's just one big lie. But they're they're desperate to hold on to it because otherwise there's no other alternative. You have to accept a biblical creator. And then when you accept that, then you have to admit you're going to be accountable to him. And what does he want? And those are questions they don't want answered. So they come up with this joke of a theory, if you really look at it. And there's just no lie too big for them to hold on to evolution. It's just because they don't want to submit to God. It's as simple as that. And I just, I have so much pity for the people that fall for this, even in the church. 
But back to Hebrews. Uh, we're going to jump down to verse 13. Uh, Paul, or the, the author of Hebrews, which is unknown, um, goes into just the patriarchs of the Old Testament. One example of incredible faith after another. But there's something interesting about this. Is and I'm going to start at verse 13. These all died in faith without having received the promise. But they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. I mean, God takes faith seriously. It, it, it kind of gets set to the wayside in, in our attempt to, to follow, you know, man-made religion and all this. But really, it's, it's all about faith. It's just simple faith in Christ. And everything else comes from there. It, I mean, God here even says he's not ashamed. If he's not ashamed to be called these people's God, there are people that he's ashamed to be called their God. Because they don't, they don't trust him. They don't believe him. They say they do, but do they act like it? You know, faith, faith is a substance. There should be something there. And so I can't stand those ancestry commercials. I mean, you probably see them. They test your DNA and all your answers lie in your DNA and your life is defined by someone who lived 500 years ago. And I mean, it has absolutely nothing to do with who you are today. You know, they just, they got this whole parade of people that they can't find themselves. They're lost and until they know all about where they came from. But that, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible is always looking forward, not backwards. It's not about where you came from. It's about where you're going, and more importantly, who you're going with. You know, there's nothing wrong with being curious, but basing your entire being on your ancestry instead of who God is, is completely missing the point of faith. Because faith is always looking forward. It's, it's the hope of things unseen. If, if, if you could look at your ancestry and see it, you know, that's, that's not unseen. You're, you're putting your hope in something that is artificial and man-made. Obviously, your DNA is not man-made, but just the, I'm talking about the idea. The idea is of just, I'm trying to think of the specific one. Just some woman, you know, discovered her ancestral tribe of from... 700 years ago and oh that's where i get who i am today and what are you talking about that has nothing to do with who you are today but and i don't know i just people just don't want to see that they just have this desperate need to know where they where they came from and god is calling you to look at where you're going and that brings us back to abraham i mean he was promised a great nation he never saw it. Many of the prophets who prophesied Jesus never saw him. Moses never saw the prom promised land. I'm sorry, he saw it from a distance, but he never got to enter it. And that's a little bit different. That was because of his own sin and, and not just because it was for a different generation. But he never saw it or never got to go in it, never got to experience it. And, and then, so that brings us to Jesus and what I really wanted, that was some groundwork, but what I really wanted to talk about was there's two times Jesus was amazed. Once, the, the, the way we all want Jesus to be amazed is by faith, an act of faith, but he was also amazed at a lack of faith. And uh, before I get to Luke 7, 9, the story you know what happened is a Roman centurion. I mean, this pagan Roman, who who 
by all rights, doesn't belong in Jerusalem. He's there to oppress the Jews, but he knows who Jesus is. He obviously heard about him, and but he just doesn't know who Jesus is. I mean, he really knows who Jesus is. He's, he, he's, he sends his servants to go to him and says, Lord, I'm unworthy to even come to you or to have you in my home. But all I, you don't even need to. Tells him, just say the word and, and my servant will be healed from right where you're at because he understood authority. You know, he, he lays out how he understands authority because he tells his own servants, go here and they go, do this and they do. He speaks the word and it happens. And he understood that about Jesus. And I'm going to read Luke 7, 9. It says, Jesus heard this and was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found so great a faith even in Israel. And that, that just must have stung really bad to all those Jews, the people of God, standing right there that this pagan Roman who's there to oppress them, understands Jesus and faith better than they do. You know, he was amazed because he knew he didn't have to be there. I mean, remember what Mary and Martha told Jesus when Lazarus had died? If only you had been here. You know, they were his closest friends. And, and, and he loved them very much and they loved him and it's not taking away from them. But they didn't understand what this Roman understood. They said, if, if, if you'd only been here, they didn't understand. He didn't have to be there. No, oh, he wanted to be there. And, and obviously he had a plan. There was a purpose there for his delay. But it's just the understanding. He didn't have to be there. He could have spoken a word right where he was. It's because the Roman commander understood authority. And he took it a step further and understood that Jesus had sovereign authority over all the earth, not just where he was standing. He understood that, it, that if Jesus simply spoke a word, it was so. You know, I won't, I won't go into the, to the verses, but there's many women who also, the same thing. They, Jesus was impressed by their acts of faith while at the same time scolding the religious people and even his own disciples sometime who just told them to go away, weren't concerned with their act of faith at all. And that brings us to the flip side that Jesus was also amazed at the lack of faith. And, you know, and I'm, I'm really going to get in trouble if I'm probably already in trouble, but I'm really going to get in trouble. But this next section of scripture is really where a lot of churches are right now. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. And, and I'll read um, what had happened is Jesus went to his hometown and they were just offended by him because, well, you know, isn't this the son of Mary and Joseph? Aren't his brothers and sisters here among us? They were offended at the idea that somebody from their town was you know kind of a big deal but it it says mark 6 6 so he was not able this is jesus we're talking about he was not able to do any miracles there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them and he was amazed at their unbelief now i mean just i'm gonna read that again this is Jesus. So he was not able. Faith is a requirement. It's not negotiable. It's not acceptable to not, you know, lack of faith. Faith is a requirement if we want to see God do anything in our lives. You know, the Bible says he's a rewarder of those who seek him and believe that he is. And, you know, of all the things that, that Jesus could be amazed by us, and, and it, it was unbelief. And we have that same unbelief today. I mean, think about it. If we had just one miracle in our churches today, we would all be blown away. 
If our entire lifespan we saw one miracle, we would always go back to that one miracle and praise God for it, not taking away from it. But most people don't see any. But if we just had one, we would be blown away. But I mean, really dig into this verse and, and meditate on it. it. It it comes off as a disappointment. He said he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. I mean, my gosh, if we had a few sick people get healed in our services, we'd all be really I'd be extra blown away. But here it's a disappointment. And he was amazed at their unbelief for just a few. I mean, really, how, how much worse are we? For the most part, I mean, we see none. How much, uh, how much more unbelief than these do we have? I mean, I just, I know I read, and, and there's a lot of people, we, we read through the, the book of Acts, and, and not just that, but the letters of Paul and, and the people, and it wasn't just the disciples. There's an account, I forgot the reference right now, but there's an account where the, the disciples of Jesus came and said, hey, these other people are healing in your name. Should we go tell them not to? And Jesus says, no, leave them alone. If they're, you know, if, if, if you're uh, not for us, you're against us, and these people are for us. So leave them alone. There were other people. And so what's going wrong? What are we doing wrong? We, we, we need, the church needs to ask the honest question, what are we doing wrong? I mean, people use the excuse, well, miracles were only for that time. And, you know, I'm still waiting for the verse that says so. You know, I, since my last, I said the same thing in my last sermon about faith and just, Nobody produced anything, so still waiting for that verse. I've been told that so many times, and I said, okay, where in Scripture does it say that? Crickets. You know, they might come up with some man-made religious teaching without any scriptural reference whatsoever, but it's that's just another lie. It's It's really... It's a vain attempt to bring in new believers. We just dismiss the things of God because we're embarrassed by the activity of the Holy Spirit. You know, he, he might do something crazy, and we don't want people to get scared away by that. It's like, you know, gee, and it's not crazy, but that's just what people, that's the only way people know it by. But, I mean, Jesus did all that crazy stuff, and he had large crowds following him. It's, it's not going to send people away. People are starving to death for the things of God. And in, in our own shame and guilt, we deny Him. We deny Him the, the spiritual food of God because we're just afraid they're going to choke on it. And nothing could be further from the truth. It's, we just, we, we, we're creating a safe space for people. But here's the thing. God's not safe. Think about people who encountered the risen Christ. They fell down as if they were dead. They were so afraid. That that's who Jesus is. He you know, he's not the baby in the manger anymore. He he's not who he's been made out to be. He's not snuggle Jesus or hippie Jesus and just says peace to everyone. No. People were terrified of him. They fell down dead when they got a look at him. The, the, the religious people were so threatened by him, they wanted to kill him. I mean, just read the life of Jesus. Everywhere he went, thing, he turned things upside down. He, he was a threat to the religious power and authority of the day. He was a threat to, to evil and wickedness. He was a threat to the demons that were polluting people he was a threat to the sin in everybody's life and he and he was a threat to unbelief he was he was angry at people's unbelief one of the crowds he called an evil and faithless generation i mean you don't hear that preached anymore and then his apostles went you know and they did the same thing they went and turned the whole world upside down demonstrating the, the kingdom of God everywhere they went. 
They, they were not safe. Every town they went to, the people were not safe from the gospel. You know, think about um, in Mark 8, 11. The, you know, the Pharisees asked for a sign and people like, they just love to point to this and say, see, anybody who looks for a miracle is, is evil because Jesus said you're not going to get a sign. And only an evil person would ask for a sign. So that's that's the excuse for, well, There's that's why there's no more miracles today. But these same Pharisees that Jesus said this to, they saw everything he did. They followed him everywhere he went, hoping to find something to use against him. You know, here's the sad thing. The, the miracles that he did right in front of him, that's what they tried to use against him. I mean, how... How pitiful is that? Show us a sign. Oh, you, you, you mean you missed when I, that guy's withered hand was made perfect right in front of you? The crippled man got up and walked right in front of you? The blind man saw right in front of you? Lazarus, Lazarus was raised from the dead right in front of you? The, the truth of the matter is they already had a sign. They had every sign they needed, the, the signs, the wonders, the miracles, it all happened right in front of them. Jesus wasn't talking about that when he said, you're not going to get a sign or wickedness asked for a sign. They were looking for, for like a flash of light in the sky that Jesus would wave his hand and the clouds in the sky would part or, or something to that of that nature. And, and that's what people are looking for today. I won't believe in God until, you know, he puts a sign in the sky that says, believe in me. And, and Jesus is saying to you, only a wicked and perverse generation would ask for a sign. But if you look at what God is doing here on the earth, that's all, that should be all the sign you need. I mean, that, uh, why do we say, we quote the Bible when he, God says, for what is impossible for God, but then we really act like everything is. We just, we don't believe. And, and here's part of the reason why we just live in this age of information and, and people run to the wisdom of men. You know, 1 Corinthians 2, 5 says, faith rests in God, or this isn't word for word, this is a paraphrase, but faith rests in God, not the wisdom of men. And, and I'm, I'm just mind blown that people run to the wisdom of men every time. Something out of the ordinary happens. They, they, what does my TV tell me? What does the news tell me? What's this human leader telling me? Don't even bother turning to God. You know, I talked about evolution earlier. People, even in the church, people run to evolution for the answers. You know, and then it's big right now, so... But biology, just basic biology. Human sexuality. You know, just one more way for people to rebel against God. He has his original design. Male and female, he created them. No exceptions. God did not make a mistake when he created you. You weren't, you weren't born a boy in a girl's body or a girl born in a boy's body. God knew what he was doing. This is just rebellion against God. God made men to have a wife. He made women to have a husband. That's God's creation. You can argue with God about it all you want to, but that's what he says. And, and people just always, they run, oh, but the science and... Again, this is agenda-driven science. There's there's nothing of substance there. I mean, if you actually read it, look into it, read the counter-arguments, there's just absolutely nothing there. It's it's fluff. It's it's human humanistic fluff meant to push an agenda. And if there was any substance to anything they're saying, they wouldn't have to persecute anybody who says differently. I mean, the real proof that they're lying to you is their behavior. I mean, you don't have to read a thing. Look at their behavior. They just, they have, they have, they have no choice. The science isn't there. The wisdom isn't there. The truth isn't there. Their only option is to destroy anybody who says anything differently. That's really how you can see they're lying. But 
faith rests in God, not the wisdom of man. And in James, what I like about the book of James, you know, James James isn't kidding. James isn't playing any games with people. You know, he doesn't have time to to just lie to you, really, for what it is. And not that any of the other biblical authors do, but I mean, compared to, you know, these pop culture preachers we got now, you know, James isn't playing games. He's not messing around. James 2.19, you believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. It, you know, faith, and what James is getting at here, faith has action. It's not a feeling. Just like the Roman centurion it changes your life. It moves you. It draws you in closer to Christ. You know, a lot of people, like, they say, oh, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. And then take a look at their life. And say, Are you sure? Are you sure that's what you believe in? You know, it's like the person, and this is an actual person, said, oh, you believe in Jesus? Oh, you know, what? What part of the Bible are you reading right now? Oh, I don't read my Bible. Oh, what are you praying about right now? I don't pray. Oh, what church do you attend? I don't attend a church. I don't need any of that. I mean Jesus. Obviously not. You're not doing any of the things that get you closer to him or increase your faith, but you have faith in him. Don't obey him. There's no evidence that you love him at all. And again, I'm not talking about people who are, who are legitimately struggling with something. You know, everybody's got an issue or that one thing that just always gets you. Some people, it's a couple things, you know, but that's why you have faith. God is in the constant process of, of delivering, delivering you, changing you. That's what faith is. It's constant motion of changing you. If you're not being changed... There's not little to no faith there. But all, like Jesus said, all you need is a mustard seed. That's where it starts. And then it just grows as you water, fertilize. It grows and grows. And now you call out to the mountain, move and go over here, and it goes. You know, there's two things that I love the most when I look at people. Is, is a transformed life or someone stepping into their calling, even for the first time. You know, that, that, that step of faith that they took. You know, this doesn't make sense, but God commanded it, and I'm going. And, you know, in, in this, and I'm really going to get in trouble, but that's okay. You know, this, this whole coronavirus thing, you know, it, it really exposed the church. People don't want to admit it. They want to make excuses. They want to say, but, but something else. You know, it, it's just, it's another example of the wisdom of men. Their TV told them this is what they have to do or billions of people are going to die. And without question, people just got in line and did whatever their TV told them to. Even closing their church. You know, and I can understand at first there's a lot going on and people are still trying to get things figured out. You know, I get that. But then... Some people realized, no, you know what? I'm sticking with Christ. My church is going to be open. And some other people said, I'm sticking with man. I'm closing my church. We're not going to open. We don't need it anyway. And just no faith whatsoever. You know, and, and early on, there was a lot of people who just... This minute, you know, me and Aaron, we took the position, you know, we're, we're trusting in Christ with our future. Our future's in his hands. This virus, this boogeyman virus, as I've called it, has no say whatsoever in where God is going to take Aaron and I, our marriage, our family, our son. It, it has no say. We're with him wherever he takes us. And I remember walking through the grocery store. I think it was like early March of last year and I, I really heard this just in, intruding voice I, it's hard to describe but this intruding voice in my head said 
I got you. I gave you the virus. I said, no, you don't. And just continued to go shopping. We moved on. You know, because it doesn't. And, you know, when I think about all the people that told Aaron and I, you know, we're just going to die. Oh, I hope people even hoped we would die just so it could prove the point that we were wrong and they were right. Well, we're still here. We're doing just fine. You know, I, we, neither one of us have spent a single day in quarantine. We refused outright from the beginning. We are not going to hide under our bed because the TV told me to. I mean, there were places where we have to wear a mask and it wasn't worth the fight. Like, it works, so I have to wear a mask at work. I still do. It's utter ridiculousness, but, you know, I, I did not miss a single day of work because I was afraid of getting the virus. Erin, she, she has a kidney, she's immunosuppressed from her kidney transplant. According to the news, oh, she, surely she shouldn't be alive. If we believe the, the you know, the, the lies, the nightly news. And I, I lost count. We both, we joked about it. We lost count of how many times she was directly exposed to this so-called worst virus that has ever been in existence, the way people act, directly exposed, sneezed on, coughed on by people who had it. Nothing. She didn't even sneeze. If you believe the news, she shouldn't have made it. But we don't believe the news, we believe God. You know, people will look at me and say, well, well, you're healthy, so you, you know, you're just so lucky you're healthy. I don't trust my health. I trust in God. God is the one who keeps me healthy. It had nothing to do with my biology or, or anything. I mean, and, and I, you know, I gave someone who was positive a hug. I shouldn't be alive if you believe the news. But here I am. Here Aaron is, my son, exposed so many times at school. They're scared to death to open the schools. Well, that, what was it? I'd have to ask Aaron. Two or three times they were exposed at school. He had to come home. I mean, we didn't quarantine. He had to come. He couldn't go to school, but, you know, we're, we're not a people that are going to hide under our beds. You know, we have a life to live, and we're going to live it. And he was totally fine. Not one person in their class. He got tested. Other people in his class tested. Nothing. The kid who had, who was positive, nothing. I mean, you just... I wish people would investigate this kind of thing instead of just doing what your TV tells you to. And I think about um, Mario Morello and his tent crusades. At the height of the, of the positive cases, so-called positive cases, in the worst state imaginable with the highest rate of positive cases, he has a tent crusade. No masks. Thousands of people crammed into a tent because they wanted Jesus. Not one positive case came out of that. Not one. He waited two weeks before he rep reported just to make sure but he already knew but so people would really understand he waited he's done three or four now i think during this pandemic when we're all supposed to be hiding under our beds nothing not one positive case from his tent crusades no mask no social distancing no quarantine and people will just say oh well you're just lucky no that's, that's faith. That's Christ in our lives. You know, then people, we, we can argue back and forth and debate back and forth about, you know, oh, well, then do you wear a blindfold and go walk across the freeway? No. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous to say. Nobody, we're not talking about that. We're talking about living your life as God called you to. God didn't call you to hide under your bed in fear because your TV told you to. I mean, take back, 
go back and look at reports from last February, last March. Hold these people accountable for every single lie they told you. Every, everything that was in, initially reported and continues to be reported today can be verified as either misleading, a half-truth, or a lie, just an outright lie. Because there's an agenda behind it. And, and I know that people died. I, my building lost somebody. People die from diseases every day. It's heartbreaking and it's sad, but it's reality in a sinful world. People who trust in Christ die. Just like it said here, these people died without ever having seen their faith. But I'm not looking anywhere except to Christ. If, if I die in faith, I, I can't think of a better way instead of dying hiding under my bed, afraid of the world. So that's not to put anybody down or, or challenge anybody or question. I'm just, or I am challenging actually. I'm challenging people to take God at his word. And there's certainly things I need to get a deeper faith about. And I'm challenging myself. Maybe I, maybe I, maybe I did pretty well here, but there's other areas I'm really failing at. And I need to do better. I need, Jesus is saying to me, why, where's your faith? Why are you faithless in this area? That's, that's something that everybody needs to do. But don't just accept the man-made wisdom and base your life on that instead of the Word of God and what God is saying. So, you know, it, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but that's okay. I just really want people to get this inside their heart taking uh, God at his word. I just can't imagine what the church would look like if, if every single church rose up in unity against the evil that we see in the earth today. Talk about mountains moving. All right, so really hope that you'd be encouraged by this. Don't be offended. If you're offended that's okay be encouraged and just say it in love and i hope that you have an excellent easter weekend god bless